Okay, guys, I'm going to get started. Thank you for coming. My name is Adam Thomas. I head up the uh, data science and sharing team within the NIMH, and I'm going to talk to you today about data sharing and open science in neuroimaging. Uh, so quickly, some credits. Um, these are a number of people that are have done a lot of work in the open science community. Russ Poldrack, Chris Gorgoluski, Brian Nozek, Talia Coney, Nico Krigoskorta, uh, Tom Nichols, and Phil Bourne. I've uh, borrowed their material liberally, um, so thanks to them. A uh, quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to talk about why we need open science, what problems are we trying to solve, uh, what open science actually is, and how you can open science. How do I do open science? So first of all, the why, or what is the problem? What, 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 are, we, what are we here trying to solve? Um, so let me start off with an illustration. Uh, has anyone here been in a play? Can you raise your hand if you've been in theater before? One, two, three, four, four. OK, great. So plays are a lot of fun. So uh, what's the goal? Tasha? Tell a story, right? How do you know if you've succeeded? Yeah. What's a good play? Right. You tell them a story. They feel things. They, uh, maybe, you, maybe you've made them think a little bit. It's, it's, a, it's an enterprise that is sort of it's, Sometimes you do multiple plays, but you know the, what's happening there is, is how you've made those people feel and think on that particular day. How many of you have built a bridge? Fewer. Fewer people have built bridges. OK. So bridges also can make you feel things. Like this is a particularly attractive bridge. Uh, you, know, you, might, you might look on it and think that that's a, that's a nice bridge, and it could, uh, it, could, it could make you think of things, maybe happy memories. But it also stays up. It doesn't fall down which is a very important thing when you're building a bridge that you have to worry less about when you're doing a play. So it's art versus engineering. OK, so uh, again, about success, sometimes you might, you might have a bad play. You might fall off the stage. Uh, you might embarrass yourself. People might say, like, oh, that was a really stupid play. But you know, life goes on. It changes, and, you, and there always will be someone to say, oh, it's not that bad. It might be your mother. You never know. But uh, it's, it's art. There's, there, there's room for interpretation. Bridge falls down. If you fail on a bridge, if you do a bad job on a bridge, the bridge falls down. And sometimes people die. So the illustration that I'm trying to make here is that we're doing science. And science is both an art and a, a feat of engineering. Um, we write papers, we give scientific talks, and most of what we care about when we're doing those things is, again, making people interested, making them excited, perhaps making them feel things, making them read the paper, making them cite the paper. That's a big part of what we focus on. I just came from the three-minute talk uh, stuff this morning. A lot of it is about communication. But in the biomedical sciences, we are also building bridges. We are making discoveries, and there are a specific sets of rules that we have to get right. Otherwise, the science will fall down, and people will get hurt. And so that's the why. The bridges are falling down. So this is, a, this is a, one of many graphs that you can find out there from Brian Nozick um, talking about reproducibility. On the, on the, on the uh, x-axis, you have the original effect size. On the y-axis, you have the replication effect size. And what I'm, I'm sure you've all heard about this ad nauseum. We've been talking about it for 10 or 15 years now. Um, most of our studies that we are producing are not reproducible. And that suggests that the science that we're doing is not revealing the truth of the way things work. It means that the little bolts in the bridge are not as secure as we thought they were. So that's one of the big whys. And again, uh, this is not new. Um, the, one of the papers that got this uh, started was from uh, John Aeneides, came back in 2005. So we're, we're coming up on 13 years of sort of uh, wringing our hands about this. Things might be getting better. Some people think it's getting worse. But the problem is there. Uh, so that's only one of the problems, the uh, bridge falling down problem. Uh, another problem that we're trying to address is wasted time and resources. So this is a very informal scientific poll that has been done by a couple different groups, where you go around and ask a bunch of researchers, how much time do you spend handling, reorganizing, managing your data, wrangling, some people call it, uh, as opposed to the actual doing of science, You know, thinking about your domain, forming hypothesis, reading the literature. The mean answer is 80 percent. 80 percent of the time, you know, you're reformatting your spreadsheet or trying to figure out how your columns got misaligned in your R code or something like that. Or maybe just digging through old hard drives or USB drives saying, oh, where did that postdoc who left put that data? So that's also a problem. 
Um, also in the wasted time and resources category is unpublished data. Um, it's very uh, also known as the file drawer problem. So it's very common. Somebody comes into the field, uh, or that might be a postdoc, or it might be a graduate student. They they get they collect a valuable data set. Maybe it's on Williams syndrome patients, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's a particular. Uh, 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 mutation for a schizo schizophrenic gene, then you fly all the people in. They do their study and then they go on to their next postdoc. Or maybe they leave the field. Maybe they get uh, recruited by industry. And then that extremely rich data set only has one or two papers on it. And then maybe the data never sees the light, again, light of day again. Uh, that can be, as I said, so that's lost staff and lost metadata. It can be very hard to figure out uh, after that person is gone how to analyze that data. Um, and it's also underutilized. So there's a, a a lot of uh, papers that are published today look at one modality or one particular question where uh, there's almost always something else that can be asked of that data. And that question might not be apparent the day that you are, or the year that you're analyzing it. It might only become apparent, apparent years later when you find out that that disease or that disorder is related to something else that comes up in the literature. Um, and so these problems are not really new. Um, uh, so if you look at like the Blue Ribbon panel that was published in 2008, uh, they talked a lot about the lack of transparency and reproducibility, how it hinders integration. Um, I will spare you the quote. That is the that is the long version of that. Um, you can you can go look at these these Blue Ribbon panels. They do them every every five or ten years. Uh, and um, this is one from 1975. Again, it's talking about the lack of integration, how it's very siloed, and how we're not actually sharing these things. All of these things could be addressed by data sharing. Uh, and if you want to go read some of those Blue Ribbon panels, the uh, the NIH library has a wonderful archive of them. I will make these slides available, so don't feel uh, the need to scribble down any of these URLs. OK, uh, final aspect of the problem is what uh, Phil Bourne has referred to as the big data revolution. Phil Bourne was uh, recently the chair of the Office of Data Science within NIH. Um, and he argues uh, that the organization and accessing biomedical big data will require a different, fundamentally different business model. Um, so just to illustrate this, uh, the UK biobanking uh, Im imaging initiative recently put together a, a set of slides. So this is actually a short movie. It's very cool. Um, and they talk about how the typical study in imaging is maybe 125 subjects. And we know that that's on the big side. We do plenty around here that might be 20, right? Or maybe even 12. I published one that was 12 not too many years ago. Um, so the UK Biobanking Initiative is doing 100,000 brains. They're going to image 100,000 people. And that's just a very different enterprise from what what we do. It requires very different tools. It requires different computing. It requires different storage. You can't analyze 100,000 brains with an Excel sheet and a laptop. You need to do things differently. Um, and it's not going to stop there. Uh, President Obama ha started the one million person health study. Uh, they're not imaging all those people yet, but it's that's not far away. People are talking about imaging people uh, in that in that kind of scale, and it's just a different enterprise. Uh, so sorry. So talk, to talking again about the um, about this revolution that Phil Bourne uh, refers to, he also says it's going to happen very quickly, um, and that the uh, previous way of doing science is going to be eclipsed and left behind uh, by the by the new methods. So the um, there's a lot of uh, examples of this out in Silicon Valley. So what digital photography did to film and the likes of uh, Kodak, or what the what the Uber did to taxis, or what uh, 3D printing is doing the manufacturing industry. It looks like it's. Uh, it's catching on slowly at first, and then suddenly the uh, curve of the exponential comes into play, and the previous method is uh, vanishes entirely. So these are the problems. We're trying to work on the reproducibility, the bridge falling problem, the wasted resources, uh, the lack of integration and reuse of data, and, uh, and the fact that our, that our, our scientists and our, our trainees are possibly ill-prepared to work with very large data sets. OK, so what are we going to do about this? What is this open science that is going to address this myriad of problems? Uh, so I'm stealing a slide or a figure here from uh, Chris Gorgoluski and Russ Poldrack. They uh, have a great paper that uh, lays this out. And in their world, open science is a combination of three things. It is open data, it is open code, and it is open papers. So let's just talk about those in turn. First of all, open data. So open data is data deposited in a public community recognized repository with a stable DOI, digital object identifier. Um, so it's not just, it's not enough just to share your data, to post it on your lab's web page, or to uh, include it in a tweet or something like that. Um, the idea is that you need to think in the long term so that this data can be accessed uh, long after you've left the lab 
or, or long after maybe your investigator is not doing things anymore. So repositories are all set up, at least all, all of them today. There's some, there's some bad stories from the past, but all current repositories are set up with a, uh, with a, a long-term plan to make sure that that data is going to be accessible uh, uh, in perpetuity. Um, public repositories uh, follow what's called as a FAIR principle. FAIR is an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these, they might sound like synonyms, but these are all uh, separate things that you can get right or can get wrong. Um, I would encourage you to read NIH's uh, strategic plan for data science, which was just released last week, which goes over each of these principles and how the NIH is going to try to make these things a bigger part of the way that we do science now. Uh, and you will find the FAIR principles are, are, are well laid out in there. Um, so talking a little bit more about community-recognized repositories, there are lots of them. This is, uh, this is the MRI series, so I'll quickly go over the, uh, uh, or at least list, the MRI-centric ones. Um, OpenFMRI, which has turned into Open Neuro, is, is uh, one of the newer entries. There's Coins, there's Lonnie, there's Loris, um, and those will all take raw data, uh, or they will take your derived data, your statistical maps. The ones in yellow only take statistical maps, but uh, they're all relatively easy to upload your data to. Um, and there are also data agnostic repositories. So if you find that you have a data set or you're uh, pioneering a new method and uh, your data doesn't fit into the nice little boxes set aside for the MRI categories, there's always somewhere you can put it. Uh, there'll be different amounts of uh, sort of metadata and how much, how strongly um, organized and typed it is, but you can always find a place to get that data out there. And that's always better to put it into a community repository uh, than to not share it at all or to share it on like a website somewhere. Um, and I, the, another aspect of the, of, the, of, the, of the principles is that data should be shared uh, while it's being collected uh, and before publication. So uh, what's, what has commonly happened is that a lot of data will be collected, there will be a scramble to write the paper, analyze the data, deal with the, uh, deal with the reviewers, and then when you finally get it accepted, there is this uh, that there is this monstrous task of trying to get it into some sort of organized framework so that you could get it into one of these shared repositories. And then frequently it just doesn't happen because you're moving on to the next thing. The way to avoid that is to make sure that your data goes into the repository immediately when you collect it. So then at the end of the study you can say, okay, I included these 34 subjects and we excluded these, these these six subjects for these reasons, and then that can immediately go into a, a repository. So all of these repositories give you, an, uh, give you the option of embargoing. Um, the NIMH Data Archive, is, for example, is very good about this. So you can have your data upload directly into the repository, and from there you can sort of flag it for the time in which it's going to be released. Uh, as I mentioned, Open Neuro is a, is a great new repository out of the Stanford group. Um, it accepts uh, it, it accepts neuroimaging data, but they also will accept anything that's in the BIDS format. And we'll talk about BIDS in a second. Um, and it is entirely open and accessible. It does not require a data use agreement. So if you are uh, looking for open data, it's also a great place to go and find uh, a large number of, of healthy controls and other studies that you can validate uh, uh, some of the stuff that you're doing currently. Um, we are also running a uh, local reversion of Open Neuro. It's called the uh, NIDO, or the NIMH Intramural uh, Data Sharing Repository. Um, you can dial that up anywhere within the inter Intramural program, and, and you can add data there. Uh, if you want, if you have a data set that you want to get out there, uh, that's what my team is for. So get in touch with me, and I can help you get it into the, into the repository. Um, there are... There are already data sets in here that you can access freely. This is a data set that was put together by Javier Gonzalez Cosillo. It was the 100 runs data set. So there are only three subjects, but there are a lot of runs here. So it's a great place to explore various fMRI processing techniques. Uh, and we are closely affiliated with the NIMH Data Archive. Our, the data that is in our repository will also be uh, replicated into uh, the NIMH Data Archive, which has a lot of data from the NIMH Extramural Program. So basically any uh, grant that was funded by the NIMH is required to put their data into the NIMH data, data archive. So if there's a study that you're in interested in looking at or replicating it and you notice that it is, has NIMH funding, then you can email the NIMH data archive and they will help you find that data. Or they will help you go get it if it didn't get deposited properly. Okay. That's open data. Uh, a little bit about open code. Uh, open code enables greater reproducibility uh, in and it includes uh, both non-code methods. So the goal of, of, of this pillar is just to make your uh, 
make your study as reproducible as possible. Um, so that if somebody wants to follow up on it or they want to extend it, that they can, they can get the same results that you do. So that means that any sort of computational stuff that you do, that you can actually provide that code, as well as like a, a very thorough uh, description of, of you know, the reagents or the imaging techniques or the scanners that were used. Um, there are uh, a lot of journals these days are starting to limit the number of pages that they want, but there's always room for supplementary or there's always ways of uh, making more voluminous and less interesting information available through like a, a public archive. Uh, the goal of open code is to um, is to avoid reinvention, uh, to reuse and improve. So uh, there are a number of analysis techniques that have been written and rewritten by postdocs and postdocs all around. Uh, what open code allows you to do is go find someone who has already done the thing that you've done or done a version of it, and you can download that code and then you can modify it for your own purposes. And if you uh, and if you if you feel like you've made a useful contribution, then you can share that with the original uh, author. Uh, there are a couple, um, there's a, the, what enables this to happen is called a version control system. And the two most popular ones now are GitHub and Bitbucket. They run a, uh, a version control system called Git. Um, and uh, that gives you a lot of options. Uh, it allows you to store all of your analysis in one central place so that if you were to lose your laptop or your USB key or if your server crashes, then there's going to be a, a well-replicated storage for everything that you did so that you can, you can get it again. Um, it keeps a history uh, of snapshots of your evolving analysis. So you may have uh, been working on an analysis at some point and realized, oh, you want to do a different smoothing kernel or you want to go back and you want to change the brain stripping algorithm or something like that. Uh, so uh, version control systems like Git allow you to do that easily. You can basically create a branching point and you can say, okay, from now on I'm going to explore this path, and if you later decide that that wasn't the right way to go, you can you can restore your code to the point that you branched off, and then you can go in that a different direction. Uh, it's a really really useful uh, tool. Uh, it allows you to quickly switch between those different versions. So maybe if you haven't decided as to what the right uh, analysis stream is. Um, and as I said before, it allows you to adopt and modify code from other sciences. If you go out to any one of these repositories, there's a button you can click to clone the repository. So you create your own little copy of the repository, and then you can begin to edit it. And then, as I said before, if you decide that you would like to share your edits with the person who, noted, wrote, who wrote it initially, again, that's just a button click away. And it allows you to collaborate. So. Um, a lot of coding in science is done uh, in dark basements uh, on one person's laptop. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. So uh, Git allows you to sort of make a revision to the code, submit it into the repository, and then you could talk to your collaborator, you can talk to your, uh, or your, your PI, or maybe a postdoc in your lab and say, hey, can you look this over? And then they can go in and say, I think you should change lines 5, 6, and 23 to do this, and then they can submit something called a pull request. And then it allows you to keep track of these changes and, and view them in a very intuitive way, um, instead of just uh, staying, in, staying in your basement and making, uh, making your, your mistakes yourself. OK, finally, open papers. Open papers refers to uh, a number of things. First of all, preprint posting. Um, so preprints are uh, is something that the physics and mathematical community have been doing uh, about as long as the internet's been around, probably for 20 or 30 years. So in that world, uh, you, you produce a paper, and you upload it to one of these servers. So it was archive. Archive is the original one. And then um, it, there might go out on a mailing list. You might put it out on Twitter. You could say, hey, I've done this work. I'm interested in getting some feedback. And then the community will, will, will review it. Uh, so for archive, a lot of it will happen over email. For bioarchive, there's a, there's a bit of a message board. It might happen over Twitter. And you can get some feedback on that paper. Um, and then that gives you the opportunity to sort of uh, look for problems, to look for new approaches or different analysis techniques. And then you can edit it and then submit it onto a peer-reviewed journal. Now, this has not caught on in the social sciences or in the biomedical sciences. Uh, a lot of people are, have been very worried about scooping. And if you put it out there on archive that somebody's going to copy your ideas or your, um, or your methods, and then they're going to submit it off to some high-profile journal, journal and steal your thunder. Um, uh, but sorry, let me, I already covered that. So earlier citation. So the important thing about uh, about submitting to an archive is the moment that you push that submit button, you generate a timestamp and a DOI. 
So that enters into the, um, into the publication or into the citation tree. Uh, so which provides you with earlier precedents uh, and actually prevents scooping. So there's a wonderful blog post that's written by Nikos uh, Krigoskorta that talks about this. And he tells a story about how uh, he was working on a particular project and he, he had a competing lab that was uh, doing the same thing and he was, he was aware of that. Um, so, but he, he had written up their results and submitted it off to a peer-reviewed journal for uh, review. And uh, at the same time, his competitors had submitted it to Archive. And then, so when he was reviewing it, uh, sorry, when his paper was reviewed, he was required to cite their work because it had already appeared in the literature. Even though they were basically doing it at the same time, the, uh, the competitor had basically claimed precedence because as soon as it's on Archive, it's out there and a reviewer can demand that you cite it. Uh, preprints can be cited in grants. Uh, they can be cited uh, basically anywhere that, um, that a, a, a peer-reviewed journal is, can be. And it's really catching on. Uh, I didn't include the graph of, of how rapid this is growing. Uh, but as an example, I was uh, sitting around watching Harold Varmus and, um, and Francis Collins. Had, they did a nice little chat that they televised. Uh, I guess it was last year. And they, and they both said that, oh, yeah, all my postdocs first goes to archive, every paper. So this is just this is just the default, which is amazing because like two or three years ago it was unheard of. So it's a really useful tool, and I would uh, encourage you to look into it. Um, and also, uh, sorry, the thing I didn't mention is it guarantees open access. So it is everyone, regardless of what institution they belong to or what subscription they paid for, will immediately be able to access your your work. Um, and just to unpack that graph, it's uh, it's from Nico's. Uh, blog post that talks about the uh, curve of when is the right time to post to the uh, preprint server. So you obviously don't want to post before your idea is fully formed or until the analysis is done, but you uh, want to post um, uh, far earlier than, uh, than you might otherwise. Oh, I did include this curve. Yeah, so, so this is the uh, rate of, um, of preprint submission to BioArchive, and it is, it is growing exponentially. Um, and this is a little bit more about open access. Another part of, uh, of, of open science is open access. And this is a simple graph that basically says open access publications are cited more. Um, there has been a long culture in the field to keep your ideas close to your chest until you can uh, craft them into the perfect little story that gets accepted by nature and science. Um, that is changing. Uh, the quicker it gets out there, the quicker the ideas get there, the more impact you can have. Um, another aspect of open papers uh, is the idea of open review. And I would say this is still a little bit more controversial, but it's still an interesting idea. So um, typically, when you submit a paper to a journal, it gets the editor chooses a couple of reviewers that goes off anonymously, and then you get the feedback back. Sometimes that feedback is good. Sometimes it is bad. Sometimes it is hostile. Sometimes it takes months to see it. Um, and, but it's all uh, guarded by anonymity, so you, you really have no idea uh, what's going on. So there's an alternative idea of doing open review. Uh, and there are a couple of websites, uh, PubPeer and Winnower, are just two of them want, that make this possible, um, where you can actually engage people to review your manuscript openly. Uh, they have the option of doing it anonymously or, whether they can, or signing their review. But in the, the key thing is that what they write is is available to the, to the general public. So it encourages um, a more thorough review. It encourages a less biased review. If there is a biased review, then there is a public forum where the community can discuss it, and they can, they can flag things that are obviously biased. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's a much more transparent way of doing science. Um, and uh, yeah, it, there's obviously benefits to anonymity, but I, I think the transparency is, is, is definitely catching on. I just covered all those things. Uh, there's also a movement to uh, encourage these kinds of open science practices with badges. So uh, this comes from the, um, from the Open Science Foundation, which is run by Brian Nozick. Uh, and there can be three badges that you can get, uh, mostly in the psychology literature right now, open data, open materials, or pre-registration, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, and what they've demonstrated is that if, the, if, if, we, if we provide these incentives where it's very obvious on when you look at the front page of the, of the article, whether it includes open data or open methods or has been pre-registered, it increases the citation and the impact, uh, which is what the graph on the right is showing you. Uh, 
So there's only a handful of journals that are doing this, but it is, it is slowly catching on. OK. Um, I, don't, I did not include a sl slide on pre-registration. Um, so if you don't know what pre-registration is, just let me briefly explain it. So that is the idea where it, you can submit an idea for a study to a journal before you've actually done the study. So this, uh, from an open science point of view, it guards against a number of things. So it guards against p-hacking, so that changing the analysis after you have uh, after you have already collected the data because some hypothesis looks more attractive than the original one. It makes it very clear that you have asked a question, you have collected a data set to answer it, um, and then you have analyzed that data set without sort of changing the rules along the way. Um, and it's, that is, this is catching on in a number of, of, of journals now. Um, and it also sort of guarantees you a publication. If they accept the idea, um, then they are they are committed to accepting the analysis as well. So it's 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 always going to get in there, and it guards you against um, it guards you against uh, reviewers who want to sort of take over your study. Every once in a while, you'll get a reviewer who says, "Oh, this is a great paper, but you should have collected data X, Y, and Z and done analysis A, B, and C." Um, the reviewers agree to the data plan before any of these things are done. So it it gives you a it gives you a very clear path to follow. Now, that's not to say that you can't explore alternative hypotheses. If there are new ideas in the data that you want to look at after you've collected it, you can totally do that. You just have to label it appropriately. Saying, this was not part of the, the, part of the original hypothesis. This is exploratory research, which changes the statistical framework in which you explore it. OK, finally, how do I open science? Um, so first of all, plan ahead. Uh, uh, data sharing is challenging in the IRB world. You need to get um, your uh, data sharing consent in your protocol so that your subjects are consenting to sharing. Uh, this is becoming the norm. It's kind of gone back and forth as to what the, what the trends are. But it's now common to see um, broad data sharing included in, uh, it's, it's required in all NIMH protocols. You have to have a data sharing plan and therefore, your subjects have to consent to data sharing. And as, unless the subjects are somehow unique, whether they're gaining medical benefit or whether they're in a particular rare, rare sample, uh, they, uh, if they're not willing to share their data, then, we, then you should move on to a different subject. So to be in the study, you need to, you need to be data sharing these days. Um, so the NIMH Data Sharing Committee has produced uh, language that you can get from whoever in your lab is uh, working with the IRB. Um, so that's standardized across the NIMH. Uh, anyone who's watching this from another institution, um, there is a website that provides um, language for open brain consent. Uh, so if you don't know what to put into your consent form or your protocol to make sure that you can share data later, uh, you can go to this website and they will provide you um, well-tested language that will uh, allow you to share later. Uh, also, when you're designing, collecting, and analyzing, uh, it's good to consult with standards documents. So um, you, if you've ever talked to the AFNI folks or any other statistician, they will frequently lament that they only get the phone calls uh, at, after the data has been collected. Um, there's ways to avoid this. And there are basically checklists that allow you to figure out uh, exactly the design that you should put together and the, and the, and the things that you need to record to make sure that your data is uh, is easily shared later and analyzed later. So one of them is uh, called the Quater, Enhancing Quality and Transparency of Health Research. So they have a, a checklist that you can go through for any type of study that you might be doing, whether it's cross-sectional, interventional, longitudinal, something like that. Uh, and it really helps you form your questions and, uh, and what kind of statistical te techniques you're going to use that later. Um, you might not. Especially if you're new to science, you're not, it might not be obvious to you what kind of study you're doing. Um, but I promise you that it does actually fit into one of these boxes. So it's, it's worth uh, taking a look at this website and uh, at the beginning of your study and trying to make sure that you've covered all your bases. So uh, that's for all biomedical research. So if you're in the brain imaging community, then uh, there is another great document that was, that was written a few years ago called COBITIS, which stands for the Best Practices of Data Analysis and Sharing in Neuroimaging. Now, um, COBITIS... Uh, it's, so the best practices of neuroimaging are really not agreed upon. Uh, there are a number of people out there that um, have different opinions about whether you should, how you should do your skull stripping and how you should do your normalization and whatnot. So uh, COBITIS doesn't include so much as how to do your imaging, but how to report it. So if you're going to get, uh, if you're going to 
publish an MRI paper such that someone else actually understands what you did and possibly can reproduce it, then it's worth going through the Cobitis checklist to make sure that you have included all the scan parameters, all of the analysis choices and whatnot. Uh, it provides a great framework for figuring that out. Um, I basically talked about this already. As I said, Equator has different documents for RCTs, crossovers, observational studies. Uh, Cobitis has sections for every chunk of your analysis. Um, and both, both of them focus on reporting. I said all these already. Oh, yeah, sorry. The final thing is uh, they're, they're also really useful when you're reviewing papers. So um, if you, you may have or you will in the future uh, eventually review a paper and be frustrated that the authors have not provided you with enough information to evaluate the paper properly. Uh, and then you, as a reviewer, are kind of, you have to make the decision as to how big a deal you want to make about it. Um, but it is very useful if you can point to a, a internationally recognized standards document and say, if you want me to review this paper, I need you to fill in the, these three sections from the Cobitis document, from Cobitis doc or from the Equator document. There's not enough information here to publish or to, to review the paper. And that's just a screenshot of some of those checklists. Uh, a couple highlights from, from Cobitis. Um, it's, for all the modern scanners, it's really easy to produce a PDF of your exact scan sequences. You can include this in your supplementary. It makes things a lot easier for people that are evaluating your study. Uh, the preprocessing should include all the steps applied to the data, um, uh, not, not some subset of them. Um, you should always report all regions of interest and or experimental conditions examined as part of the research so that you can gauge the different, uh, the, so that a reader can gauge the degree of harking. Who knows what harking is? Hypothesizing after the results are known. <laughs> so it, it, happens, it happens alarmingly a lot in neuroimaging that you have one hypothesis, you test that, then you see some interesting blobs in an interesting region, and then you say, oh, well, maybe it's, in fact, the habenula that is the center of my region or something like that. Um, it's, it's, it's good to guard against. It makes the bridges fall down. Please, go ahead. I'll repeat your question. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, so with this issue of hypothesis, we can see the results. Mm -hmm. uh, is it fair to challenge the people who are writing the papers that you can't write the papers for the reason? Yes. Um, so there, well, and sometimes the results are going to be open to people who write them. So yes. That was just my next bullet point. It is OK to explore your data. We learn things from while we're doing science. But it's really, really important to tell the difference. Um, I, I, once, I once had a co-author tell me, they said, they, they said um, I really like your paper, but I, wanted to, I want you to take these conclusions and put them at the front of the paper and say, we hypothesized that. right? And it happens a lot in science. Your PI might tell you to do it. We can't do that, guys. That's why the bridges are falling down. If you did an exploratory analysis, that's great. Just say that, uh, because the statistical framework and the way that we evaluate it changes dramatically. Fair? OK. Uh, finally, organizing your data. Uh, there's a wonderful format out that's really catching on pretty rapidly called BIDS, which stands for Brain Imaging Data Standard. Uh, it's a simple and reasonably intuitive way of organizing your data and uh, describing your neuroimaging and behavioral data. It, um, it makes it so much easier to conduct analyses later. Um, as, as Dan Hamworker frequently says, that the person that you're sharing your data with will often be yourself five years later. Um, so trying to figure out you know, whether you did subject modality or how you organized the directory tree and you know, rewriting all your scripts because you know, on that particular day you decided to change things up, um, it's really easily avoided. Uh, and uh, bids is something that a lot of really smart people have been working on for three-ish years now um, to agree. Uh, the, uh, an intuitive structure that is easy to analyze and includes all the information that you need. Uh, they have a validator, so if you once you put your data in this format, you can uh, you can run it and say is everything is everything compliant with the bid standard, which is also really useful. Um, there are also a lot of tools out there that are allowing uh, you to quickly um, move from bid standards to other standards. Like so, if you wanted to get if you wanted to contribute your data to the NIMH data archive, for example, there's a bids to NDA converter. So maintaining these standards seems a little tedious at the time, but it will save you a lot of work down the road. Ah, 
finally, uh, how nearly finally, uh, how to be open is to choose your battles. Um, sometimes this talk, uh, the open science community has gotten a lot of pushback um, that some of this stuff seems a little overwhelming. I mean, it is it is more work to do a lot of this stuff, right? Uh, and and some people seem that it's just not possible to do that while they're still getting their grant and running their lab and teaching their classes, et cetera. Uh, but you can choose your battles. Uh, you don't have to do all of these things at once. And so this is, uh, this is from a, a paper that Brian Nozick wrote. This was targeted at the journals with different requirements about you know, level zero, level one, up to level three, about how open you can be. Um, and you don't have to win all the battles at once. Uh, you, 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 can, you, can, you can do these things piecemeal. There's lots of good reasons that sometimes it's not possible to uh, check all these boxes. Um, you also don't have to do it alone. Sorry, I'm going to bring all this up. Uh, so my group, the Data Science and Sharing team, was created to address uh, specifically all of these problems that I've been talking about. Uh, it's myself, John Lee, and Dylan Nielsen. We're on the third floor of Building 10, and our door is always open. Uh, we are happy to help you uh, get data into a repository, figure out how to use Git. Um, maybe you want to pull data from another repository. You know, we've, we've, we've jumped through the hoops for the Biobank Initiative, for the Human Connect Dome and whatnot. Um, anything in the big data or data sharing space, we are very happy to consult with you on. And we consult with people regularly. It's a, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, we are very happy to do it. Um, we also offer training courses. We and other people offer training courses. So there's two things uh, toward the top, software carpentry and data carpentry. Uh, these are groups that have been around for over 10 years. Um, it's uh, typically a two-day workshop that just covers some of the basic tools that you need to uh, do some of these things. They'll cover, cover shell scripting, how to do repetitive tasks quickly, um, how to use version control systems like Git, um, how, to, how to learn just enough computer science to make your life easier without actually becoming a computer science geek. So like there's a lot of very low-level database principles that um, I've actually I've bumped into a lot of scientists who kind of reinvent database principles while they're dealing with d large data sets. Uh, there, are, there are standard tools out there to, that make these things easier, and you'll find that you'll end up writing a lot less code or, end up, or doing things a lot less repetitively. Um, there's also the BrainHack community, brainhack.org. Uh, they do a couple different things. So they will have a brain hack. Actually, I'm leaving tomorrow for the brain pack hack in Singapore. That's going to precede the human brain mapping meeting. Uh, they also do something called the global brain hack, which we held here in February. It, it's 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 as much networking as it is anything. So you you. You, get, you go into a room, there's coffee, there's bagels, and there's other people at different levels of experience, and they can help you. Uh, sometimes uh, little groups will get together, and like a, a cool hacking project will come out of it. So last year at HBM, a, a small group of us got together, and we decided that the, um, the registration, the, the app for uh, accessing, for finding abstracts and talks and whatnot, we thought it was terrible. So we were able to get the data in XML format, and over the course of, uh, of uh, maybe three days, we basically we wrote a different app. I say we, it was mostly Anisha and Dylan and, and Satra. But um, yeah, I mean, a couple of people get, get, get together with the right skill set. You'd be amazing what you can, you can produce in a, in a really short time frame. Uh, they also um, run a website. Is that on here? Yeah, Neurostars. Uh, the Brain Hack community runs a website called Neurostars that you can ask any kind of brain analysis question. Uh, there are a lot of places to ask questions, but they're usually tool specific. Right? There's an AFNI mailing list, there's a free surfer mailing list, there's an ANTS mailing list. Neurostars, they're not going to uh, they're not going to judge you about what application. They're not going to try to sell you on whatever their particular brand is. They will answer whatever question you have. Um, they also have a Slack channel. If there are people that use Slack out there, uh, it is also a great place to go in and get quick answers to your questions. Uh, sorry, that's an old slide. This is these are last year's slides. We put together a, uh, a workshop on open and reproducibility, open and reproducibility, com open and reproducible computing neuroscience last year. We did a couple of them in March and November. We don't have any planned yet for this year, but they will come along. So stay tuned. Uh, that was about the August one. All right, summary and take homes. Science is changing, hopefully for the better, uh, in both in both scope and then it's becoming bigger, and culture, and it's becoming more open to address future challenges. Open science strives to maximize reproducibility and transparency of data, code, and papers. Adopting open science practices yields benefits in productivity, impact, and reach. More people will read your papers if they are open. You don't have to do it all, and you don't have to do it all at once, and you don't have to do it alone. 
And that's it. Uh, I'll put these slides online uh, so you, the, you can look up all the URLs. Do you have any questions? Hang on, hang on. I, now I have to give you the mic. This is this is what they told me to do. So uh, how far do you have to go with uh, making your data anonymous? Uh, the, the name is obvious, but things like uh, age, gender, uh, scan location, scan time. Um, it's a complicated answer. Uh, but what is generally accepted now, I mean, so, okay, so the short answer is we'd happy to, we're happy to help you. If you have a data set that you want to share and you want somebody to say it's okay, let us know and, we'll, and, and, we, will, and we will pass it over. Um, it sort of depends on your consenting, but what we, yeah, the usual, you take out the, the, the date, uh, we usually deface the data. If it's a structural MRI, if it's possible to reconstruct the face, we'll remove the face. And again, we have tools for that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, the date and sort of specific information that you can trace it back. There is a website that uh, lists, there's actually two different ways of doing it. One of them is, one of them is fairly extreme, and the other one is sort of written as if uh, someone knowledgeable in the field determines that it is a reasonable effort at de-identification. Um, so, and when you look at the repositories out there, there's quite a bit of variability. A lot of the data in the NIMH data archive is not defaced, right? So, it kind of depends on where you're going and what your consent says, but let us know if we can help. You pass the mic. Thanks. Uh, if you have gotten halfway through your study and you don't have language in your consent for sharing all aspects of the data, What's the next best thing that you can do? Just share the, the group level data, or um, what's, what's the recommended course of action then? Mm, complicated answer there. You can definitely share the group level data. Uh, so um, NeuroVault or, or, or NMR or something like that, it's always a good idea to share your group level data. Um, you can, all, I mean, depending on how, I mean, it is, there's a fair amount of precedence of doing this stuff post hoc. So Javier's data subjects had not originally consented to broad sharing. So we called them up, had them sign something, and then we were able to share it freely. Um, there are some particularly valuable data sets that have been at the NIH for many years that we are working with now where it's just really not possible to, con to contact and reconsent those people. But we're seeing the IRB make exceptions. If you make a reasonable attempt to reconsent someone, um, they, if, if you de-identify it, they, they, they'll allow you to share it. Um, there, there's, there's arguments amongst the people that look at the Office of uh, Human Protections, but de-identified data is technically not human data anymore. So it's somewhat variable case by case. But uh, yes, the easiest thing to do would be to share the group data and as much as you can. Or even if you have a couple that are consented, you could, you could share those as a representative example so they can get an idea of what the data looks like. But if you want to do more work, you can probably share the whole data set if you, if you work with the IRB. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, guys.